In this episode of Bristol Built, we take a look at L.C. King Manufacturing. For most of the 20th century, the mainstay of employment in the East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia region was textiles and the manufacture of clothing. The competition was the Orient, but because of tariffs, shipping costs, and quality issues, we held our own in the retail clothing market and in supplying the raw textiles. Oh, there were so many sewing factories in this area, it's amazing. I can remember as a kid, there were 13 Buster Brown plants just up in Southwest Virginia. Right next door, there used to be a, a, a was band uniform, cheerleading uniform. Then you used to have, I don't know if you remember how long you've been here, but there was Cozy Dozy. Used to be Gordon Garment. Levi's used to have a plant in uh, Johnson City. Burlington had a plant in Johnson City. Uh, Levi's had a pl plant in Mountain City and a, and a facility down in Knoxville that actually employed 3,600 people when I was a kid. But now it's just really us and uh, I think uh, there's a small blue jean maker down in, South, in North Georgia, but around in here, we're, uh, we're one of the few people still left in the Southeast cutting and sewing. The company that Jack King is referring to is L.C. King Manufacturing, a small company started by his great-grandfather that is located one block from State Street. Well, uh, I'm the fourth generation. My great-grandfather, he started this factory, and he brought in his four sons, which were uh, my grandfather, Papa Jack, Gene, Richard, and uh, Dan, my, da my dad's, uh, my grandfather's brother. And for those four boys, there were two sons, my dad Riley, or Jack Riley King, and his cousin Richard King, and those two gentlemen ran this factory from probably around 1973 until probably in the early 90s. And then, my, then Richard, he retired. And my dad was around for about five years by himself, and he came to me and he said, Jack, I could use some help. And so I decided to leave my job in Atlanta, come on up here, and I started in 1998, in November. And then all of a sudden, you know, my dad and I, we worked together, and uh, it was uh, right when NAFTA happened, so all of a sudden, a change in a complete business dynamic for us. That business dynamic was devastating for the company. All the production basically packed up when NAFTA came, and then three or four years later when China joined the WTO, it took the tariff off any imported clothes coming in from China, and all of a sudden just the garments that were being imported into America actually reduced in price by 40%. So basically at that point in the game, a lot of people just said that we're not going to make anything here in America. The company had been making clothing for several brand names, and even the company's own pointer brand jeans were in several big box stores. But with those tariffs coming to an end, the number of workers went from 200 to the present number of 28. But unlike so many other clothing factories, they did stay in business. But, but I'm still here because you know why? I won't quit for nothing. And this factory is just too important. Um, I, I, I sort of gave up on it probably the first three or four years when I first got in here because I said, because I wanted to go back to a city. And then finally uh, I sort of wised up real quick and said, you know, took hold of it and said, you know what, these people mean a lot to me right now. And I'm not going to do anything to detriment their way of life. Or, you know, I got a lady here. She's been here 40 years. Her sister's been here 30 some. I got several employees that have been here over 30 years. That's spending your whole life in one factory. And when you meet these individuals and you sit and have lunch with them and just, you know, just hang out with them and stuff, you know, they become your friends and you want to work harder to make sure that they have a place to go and have a nice life and make a great product because they enjoy making it. They really do. That's the key. But, um, you know, it, this is a great place to live, and I, I probably, I'm glad I made the decision to come back home. That decision is beginning to pay off. There's nothing that says America more than a pair of blue jeans. And while the older generation seems to gravitate to stores with the lower prices... These youngsters, or young hipsters is what they're known as, uh, they're actually gravitating back to authentic Americana, which is the overall, the carpenter gene. You know, they're, they're looking for something that's comfortable to be, to move around in, and that, that is the perfect item for us, is because we make them probably the most comfortable gene you'll ever put on your body. Younger people going after a specific clothing style is the definition of fashion. Could Bristol, the birthplace of country music, also be a center of fashion? The idea is not as crazy as you may think. On August 14th of this year, the New York Times published a story in their fashion and style section called, A Tennessee Clothing Factory Keeps Up the Old Ways. 
The story was about L.C. King Manufacturing. Yeah, we were really excited. We had a the fashion editor named Kathy Horn come and see us. And she drove actually drove down for two days from New York City. And she walked in here and probably had never seen a sewing factory quite like this place, which is quite unusual. We're one of the last sewing factories in America. We are America's la oldest cut and sew factory, still owned by the founding family here in the United States. And so Kathy came down, she spent two complete days. Actually, she didn't leave till 5.30 the second day. So that means she actually spent the night in Bristol the fall, that night and then drove back on home to New York. And from New York, then she left to go to Paris for all the fancy uh, fashion shows and the couture shows. If you actually Google her, or Google her image, you'll see her standing next to Karl Lagerfeld. You'll see her, she typically writes about Chanel. And these are really high-end labels uh, in America or around the world. And also she writes a lot about a uh, designer that we work with, uh, Anya Watanabe, out of Japan. And that really was the hook for her to come down and see us, was to profile what we're making for Watanabe and the fashion house Comédie Cosson, which is really based out of uh, Japan. High fashion usually means high quality. But if you're buying your jeans from a big box store, those jeans are not made in the United States. If you're like most of the consumers, you may notice those jeans don't last very long. The stores are beginning to take notice. Well, what happened was they heard from their customer. The quality that's coming out of China is not that good. The product that you get made in China, typically a lot of times when it comes into the States, has to be reworked. And then all of a sudden the shipping charges uh, started eating everybody up. And then what happened was the Chinese labor market started demanding higher rate, higher wages. And so then all of a sudden, within the last year, we've seen a lot of uh, the domestic production come back or production come back to the United States, which has really helped us out. Jack King's great grandfather wasn't making overalls for the fashion world. He was making jeans for farmers and people who worked for a living. Those jeans had to last. That kind of quality is hard to find nowadays. It seems if you get a few months wear out of a pair of jeans, you're lucky. They're actually what's happening is on all the different stress points is where they're actually pulling and ripping. And the reason is for two reasons. One is the quality of the denim that you're it's actually being cut and sewn out of. And the other thing is the quality of the craftsmanship and the sewing. And so those are two things that we focus on here at the factory at LC King is that making sure that we have the best kind of denim that you can for workwear. Because men and women wearing our clothes are moving around all day long. They're bending over, they're picking stuff up. They're getting, sometimes they're getting grease on themselves. You know, they're up against machinery and, uh, or they're in the field. And so one of the things we had to do is we had to make sure we had a really great durable denim. And we have one that comes out of Lubbock, Texas. Now the second thing is, is the sewing that goes into making that jean. And we want to make sure that all the stress points are actually uh, put together correctly. That, a stress point is where you have a natural pull to the garment. And so we, uh, we have double reinforced tacks at those points. And uh, typically our stuff just won't unravel. And I remember getting a phone call from a man recently that he uh, complained that the price had gone up $5. And during this conversation, he was telling me that he had a pair on that he'd been wearing for 30 years. And I said, well, if they're going to last you 30 years, I think they're, going, they're worth a little bit, little bit more. Elsie King is making clothing for a Japanese fashion brand but they also have some fashion concepts of their own. I have found this individual who used to work with a brand called Nudie Jeans, N-U-D-I-E, and um, this guy is out of London, and so he's been here several times. Uh, we're actually planning a trip in two weeks all through the Carolinas, going over to Cone Denim, and we've developed a business model for a new high-end fashion brand jean that we can compete in the, on, on, in the world, and uh, we're gonna have shirts, and uh, just a bunch of different kind of components all going to be cut and sewn in this factory. But if this gentleman has come to me, he's got a pattern maker, he's got a creative consultant, and he's going to really just sort of, I guess, the best way to say it is fashion us up. And also we're going to start sewing what's called a premium line, premium denim. We'll be sewing what's called selvage, which is a unique kind of denim. That's the way the denim's actually woven. It's also it's, a, uh, it's not wide cloth, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the cloth when it comes off the roller narrow, 
And so I'm pretty excited about it. This man has a proven track record. He's got a great formula for us. We've beaten this business plan up and down. And so uh, I have full confidence that we're going to be able to pull it off and we'll be launching next spring, so a year and a half from now. With this uh, new brand that we're coming out with called LC King, we've actually trademarked that around the world. We've actually bought the domain name lcking.com and have now started to, con to start to create a brand called LC King, which uh, by, by this time next year, everybody will want to be wearing because it is going to be one of the few jeans that comes out of the actual factory that sells the brand. A lot of brands come out of a lot of different factories, but no, no, very few brands come out of the factory that it actually is named for. Traditionally, LC King has been a wholesaler, but with the internet, a retail portal has opened up and Bristol will be getting the first L.C. King clothing store, and fittingly, it's in a familiar place. So we're in L.C. King's original office here. He would uh, sit back here at this um, turn of the century desk and kind of watch over the workers and take care of business in uh, his office. And uh, we've recently begun a restoration project of this whole room. It's gonna be a retail location. It'll be open uh, in time for Rhythm and Roots, and basically we're gonna have um, jackets, jeans, and things that you can actually try on here. We have a changing room. And uh, we really hope to introduce a lot of people to, uh, to the product. This all seems like a lot to do with only 28 employees. I'm going up to 50 by the end of March coming up. So we, within eight months, I expect to have 50. And then by then we'll be uh, rocking with this new brand. We'll just be bringing more people on as we need them. And so I'm pretty excited. The labor skill force still exists in this area. I know that. And so all, all I have to do is just convince them to come and work for me. I'm a great boss to work for. I, we have great benefit package. One of our benefits is the first thing you do when you clock in on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday is you go work out at the gym downstairs. We have a trainer that trains our employees and it's been two benefits for us. One thing is I have a healthier employee base, and two, it just basically builds a camaraderie of all the employees. They're actually physically participating in a team-type atmosphere three days a week. They get along with each other much better, and uh, we actually enjoy each other's company now more so than we did before the gym. So uh, we're pretty excited about having the, the gym downstairs. If you haven't figured it out, there's a lot of pride in that building at the corner of Shelby and 7th. There's the pride in the owner of what his family has created, but there's also the pride in the employees of what they do. I was talking to Vicki, she said she was at a store the other day, saw somebody wearing our blue jeans. She walked right up to him and she goes, you know, I put the back pockets on that pair of jeans. And, I, and, she, and she goes, and Linda, she put the label on that jean, and that jean was just made right down the road from you. I just wanted you to know that. And I think the guy was sort of surprised that she actually walked up and told him that, hey, I made that, those garments, that clothing that you're wearing, and I'm proud of that, and so I think the guy had a new respect for us now. Made in the USA. Maybe it's coming back, and I couldn't think of a better place for it to start than Bristol, Tennessee.